And we're live. Welcome to another coronavirus edition of PCS q and I'm your host, MJ Boyce. I'm the Director of Community Outreach at PCS Greats. We have some very special guests today. And as always, we also have our resident PCS reform advocate, Megan Harless. Woo -woo. Um, and before she introduces our special guests and we get into the, the nooks and crannies and she gives us those updates as she does every week, um, I'm gonna go over a couple of housekeeping items, which you probably already know by heart. You're probably saying it with me as I'm saying it. So first and foremost, we bring subject matter experts, no matter what the topic is, we bring them to you so that we can get you the answers. We are going to get the answers to your questions. Whatever questions you have, just leave them in the comment section below and we will absolutely get to them. If we do not have the answers, we know who does. And if we don't know either of those things, we are taking your question for action and we're gonna get it to you in the back end. Secondly, I say this again every single time, we're flattening the curve, people. We are flattening that curve. We are doing our part. It stinks staying at home, but we are doing that. We're doing our part. And when we flatten that curve, we are flattening Murphy with it. Write it down. We're coming for you, Murphy. We're flattening you with it. And lastly, um, yes, these subject matter experts are here for you. Yes, we're going to get those answers and get them back to you and point you in the right direction and get you in contact with the people you need to talk to you, except Sometimes there's those specific situations that you might be in that are really in the nooks and crannies and the resources, the forever and always resource that you must go to that is reliable and accurate specific to your situation will forever and always be your local transportation office and your local chain of command. Those are the people who know you. Those are the people who know your stuff. Those are the people who can actually help you in dealing with your specific situation. So if for some reason, we don't cover a specific situation or scenario that you might be having. End all be all resource, take it up to the chain of command or take it directly to your local transportation office. And if you have any issues doing either of those things, hit us up and we'll see if we can help you out with that. So that brings me to Megan. What kind of DOD updates do you got for us today, Megan? Hey, everybody. So we just have a couple of updates for today. First, I want to say last week we had Transcom uh, on this webinar with us. If you have not seen that video, go back and watch it. There was a lot of great information with that. Um, as you know, the first update is that the stop move order has really kind of changed. We're no longer held to that June 30th date, but we're in what they are calling a conditions based phase opening. So locations have to meet certain criteria to be able to open for you to be able to PCS freely to and from there. They were supposed supposed to publish a list of locations. Um, that list has not been published yet. And so I've been hearing, you know, if there's no list published yet, assume all locations are considered red and you should still go through the exception to policy process to be able to PCS this summer. Uh, passports, the USMC, uh, the Marine Corps has put out some guidance about passports saying that if you have a tourist passport, you can still travel and PCS to Japan and Europe on those uh, tourist passports. Um, update number three, talking about pets. We know pet fees are always very costly for a lot of families during the PCS process. Uh, no word yet from the DOD about a pet allowance or reimbursement process for those fees. They are looking at it to see what kind of policy changes they can make to be able to help families out in regards to that. But the SPCA is offering pet grants for military families specifically in order to help offset some of those costs to be able to keep their pets with their families. Um, update number four, some new guidance that came out about uh, those folks PCSing to Bahrain and Qatar. We're gonna drop links for that information in the comments below for you. But basically it's uh, the change is that if you are PCSing there, um, you're gonna have a change in, in your orders is that they are doing away with accompanied assignments. Now, if you're already there on accompanied or if you're PCSing within the next 30 days, you'll be able to maintain that accompanied uh, status, but your tour has to be over by August 31st, 2022. Um, otherwise, all uh, PCSs to Bahrain and Qatar are gonna change to one year on accompanied assignments. And then our last update is talking about PPMs, personally procured moves, as you we mentioned last week, and to make sure everybody um, gets it again this week is that PPMs have increased their incentive for reimbursement from 95% up to 100%. That reimbursement is only good through the end of the year for the 100%. So through December 31st, uh, 2020, 
you can be reimbursed at 100% of the PPM rate instead of the 95 as it has been in the past. Um, but that's all the updates I've got for y'all now. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. And again, seriously, I mean, I really just want to impress upon you the fact that the the reimbursement rate had had increased from for a personally procured move from 95% to 100%. Even though it's time limited, it's still setting a precedent to maybe we can push that a little further and get it permanently put in there someday. But it's advocates like Megan and it's voices like yours that actually filtered through up the top um, and helped create that change. So if you think for a second that your voice doesn't matter, recognize. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, our two guests today. Um, we have uh, representatives from both Army Emergency Relief and the Air Force Aid Society. Now you might be wondering why we're gonna talk about uh, our military um, relief societies. Well, right now we're kind of experiencing some unprecedented um, challenges. And sometimes, especially with COVID, there are some financial challenges that tack itself onto that. In general, these aid societies have helped us. They have helped us, whether you know it or not. You may have volunteered for them. You may have donated yourself. But the fact of the matter is, I think that it's really pertinent to know how they can help you and why you should seek them out when it's necessary. Not to mention, a lot of you who are watching happen to be pretty embedded in the uh, mill spouse sphere or the volunteer sphere or working with the units. This is information that you can pass on to families um, as you see situations arise. So without further ado, let me go ahead. We'll start with Krista Anderson. Krista, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what the organization you work for is? Yes. Um, as you said, Krista Simpson Anderson. Um, I'm the AIM Army Emergency Relief Military Spouse Ambassador, and I get to really just go out there to make sure that soldiers and families are informed of the amazing resource that AER is and um, programs, services, and categories. Um, you know, over the years, I've recognized how important to building our resource village, if you will, is. And so it's a, you know, a personal and professional mission of mine to make sure that our families are aware of, of all resources available to them so they can thrive, you know, in this ever-changing, challenging military life. And, um, and so that's it. And thank you for, for inviting me and thanks for being a part of our village. Awesome. Thank you so much, Krista. And for those of you who don't know, um, Krista is also the uh, 2018 Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year represent. Uh, Megan and myself are also um, base level soys spouse of the years. And, uh, and we're kind of like a we're, we're kind of work with each other and this is how we collaborate and lift one another up, especially when it comes to organizations. And we also have Colonel Egan Talich, am I correct? Close enough. <laughs> oh, thank <laughs> I grew up Polish, by the way, and so I'm used to that. So I'm very hyper aware. Uh -huh. But um, but yes, could you tell me, can sure. you tell our audience about yourself and, and what our, um, uh, Air Force Aid Society sure. does? Sure. I'm Linda Egantowicz. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Air Force Aid Society. I've been in this position for about 10 years. Absolutely love it. Love the mission. Love what we do. Um, served 28 years in the Air Force, so I'm active duty retired. Um, it's hard to believe it's been 13 years now since I've been gone. Um, but the reason I'm with the Air Force Aid Society is that uh, the reason I was in the Air Force is I love the mission and I love taking care of airmen. And this position with the Air Force Aid Society allows me to continue to serve. So with that said, that's my background. Um, what is the Air Force Aid Society? We're the official charity of the United States Air Force. Um, and there are four Air Force charities, but we are the official one. We've been around since um, the Air Force was the part of the Army Air Corps. And actually, AER and Air Force came out of the same roots. So um, we're here for providing emergency financial relief to airmen and their families. That includes active duty officers and enlisted, the Guard um, Title 32502 parenthetical F, full-time active guard reserve members, reserve and guard members who are activated under Title 10 orders for more than 15 consecutive days, as well as retirees and their dependents, as well as survivors of, of deceased military members, whether they be active or um, 
uh, officer or enlisted, active or, res uh, or retired. Uh, we offer several programs. Emergency financial assistance is the first one, uh, probably the one that most of us, most folks know us for. But then we also offer educational programs, educational grants and scholarships, as well as community programs rendered through the Airmen and Family Readiness Centers on Air Force installations. Uh, those programs are offered as outright grants and they allow airmen to um, get access to free programs to help uh, leave the stressors of being a part of a military community. So proud to represent Air Force Aid Society and all those blue suitors, past and present. Oh, I love that. I love that so much, which I just have to throw this out here. So, you know, my husband, he recently retired from the Marine Corps after 20 years. Ura, yuck, yuck, simplify. Um, and our daughter happens to be um, um, with an airman um, and they're expecting a baby here in September. So now we have the Air Force on, and and then, oh, by the way, you know, that airman's dad is still active duty Navy as well. So talk about, yeah, yeah, you want to, I mean, now I have like this whole new, my eyes are open to the Air Force, which I'm learning all of the things. It's kind of neat. Uh, well, we're I've still going to jump in. Thing. <laughs> I just got to jump in. So yeah. yeah, congratulations on the on the parent to be, and uh, and the new bundle that's coming in. So the Air Force Aid Society offers a program called um, Bundles for Babies, and so it's for new parents. And you know, and and we all could use some remedial education. So if this is your third or fourth kid, go ahead, take the Bundles for Babies class, and the, and the program is offered on Air Force installation. It gives you a great education on the resources for the baby and the mom to be in that community, as well as the cost of raising a child because it's expensive. And sometimes those kids don't move out when they turn 40 years old, they're still dwelling in your basement. <laughs> so, um, but part of that is what we do at the end of the education period. Hopefully they learn a little bit about budgeting for a baby, but then we offer them a, a tote. It's an Air Force Aid Society logo tote. And inside there's a little gift card from the Air Force Army Exchange the Air exchange, PXBX, and it's a $50 gift card that we hope that the parent will go out and buy something special for the baby, but it could be, it could be a six pack that they need because this is helping <laughs> them out. So <laughs> I got to give that plug. <laughs> oh, we are going to be friends. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're on the topic, um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about like, what are the top needs? Like you mentioned um, this program, but what are the top needs um, that service members, you know, and their families typically reach out for assistance with um, for, at the Air Force Aid Society? Um, Air Force Aid Society, when we looked, I, we operate on a calendar year. So I'm looking at 2019 stats and we, we've got big chunks um, because there's just so many trails that you can follow. But we've got the biggest category of assist. 41% of our assistance went out to what we call basic living expenses. That's paying for rent or mortgage, um, keeping the utilities on or turning them on when, let's say, you've moved from one location and you haven't cleared that debt, but now you're at the new location and you got to turn on those lights, but you got to pay that one back there. So there's that. Um, putting food on the table. Sometimes people respond to certain emergencies and says, I got this. And they do. They take care of that emergency. But then, uh-oh, time to go grocery shopping and there's no, no money in the pocket. So, you know, when they present to us, that's what we capture. So that's the basic living expenses. We can't tell seven, uh, several iterations back what was the initial cause of it, but this is what they present to us. I guess the next largest category is vehicle expenses for our young airmen, especially when you're, when you've got a car that's been handed down to you, although today's airmen seem to be driving much nicer cars than I ever mm. did, but um, you know, having to re uh, repair a car is expensive today. Um, and, uh, and, and then putting tires on a car, let's say you're from Florida and you're now in a Northern tiered base, those slick tires are not going to do you any good on the back roads of Minot or Grand Forks. Um, so vehicle expenses, are the next thing. And then the next largest category is emergency travel. Um, most folks are able to take care of normal emergencies, but then when an unexpected happens, like a family member, an immediate family member uh, becomes sick or dies and they need to get that funeral, they're not budgeting for that. And, and most people don't want to think about that, frankly. And so when that happens and they have a need, we, get, we make sure that they get there to pay their final respects. So those are the biggest categories of assists. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, and and you know what, kind of very heartening and it, coming from a, a mom now. <laughs> 
that's soon to be not the G word, soon to be a Mimi. Um, but that's very that that makes me feel that makes me feel secure. You know what I mean? That yep. for my daughter. Um, Krista, what's going on? Tell me, tell me um, what what are the biggest needs that that you see at um, the Army Emergency Relief? You know, ours are very similar. Um, I would say the categories. I mean, service members are service members, regardless of the branch, and mm-hmm. and you know, families need a lot of the same things. Um, you know, AAR has assisted four million um, with you know four million families um, since inception, with um, you know with two billion dollars in relief, um, one billion of it um, actually since nine eleven, and so the the largest category has been. Um, you know, has been the basic living expenses, just like Linda said. And, and it's, you know, I can probably, you know, um, mimic everything that she said in terms of when you're going from one duty station to the next, um, you know, what if you get there and the microwave or the dishwasher doesn't work or the refrigerator is broken, you know, those appliances, or what if you're headed, you know, from JBLM to Fort Bragg and, um, and you realize your tires are, you know, are bad on your car. We want to make sure that you're safe as you're as you're making those travels. Um, and so those are definitely the um, that's the top. And we also emergency travel as well um, is is big because, um, you know, Murphy hits. Sorry, I know <laughs> Murphy is that bump <laughs> in the road as much as we want to flatten it. Unfortunately, I don't think it'll ever be flattened. But, um, you know, um, just just to I would say um, that our service members and their families can always count on the relief societies to make sure that they step in and fill that gap when Murphy does hit. No, exactly. And you know what? I would argue that what our relief societies, what you all are doing are actually the method, the bulldozer, if you will, mm-hmm. over, you know, maybe you, you go over a, a molehill instead of a gigantic mountain. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We, so that, we hope that the assistance we render, you know, AER, all, on behalf of all the relief societies, yeah. we hope when we help an airman, soldier, sailor, marine, coastie, that they're able to focus on their mission, which is to ensure the mm-hmm. safety of this country. Mm-hmm. And so that's important. That's important. And that's like, yeah. that's why we're passionate about what we do. I think that's yeah. why we all work together too. So, mm-hmm. you know, a, a soldier can walk into Air Force Aid Society and get the assistance. The dollars may come from AER, but Air Force Aid Society is gonna is going to help them if that's the closest office to them. Absolutely. So, and let's not leave out the American yep. Red Cross I, <laughs> Armed Forces because for yeah. those bases, I mean, you could be in, out in the middle of Iowa. I mean, mm-hmm. there's not a base to be found out there. There might be a reserve unit or a guard unit. I'm not familiar with it, but yeah. you could be out there. And what will end up happening is that that service member is going to have to get some assistance. And so they'll pick up the um, phone and call the American Red Cross Services to Armed Forces. Mm-hmm. And that caseworker on that other end of the line will render the assistance on behalf of the relief societies. And the airman, soldier, sailor, coastie is on their way to focusing on the mission. So that leads us into our next big question. So we say we have a service member, they need some assistance. What is the process that they need to go through to request that assistance? Is there criteria they need to meet? And then like once they request it, how soon are they on their way with handling what it is they need to? Well, with the Air Force Aid Society, and I'm pretty sure I'm speaking um, for the Army Emergency Relief Society, is that we have our website, and you can go onto the website and apply for for assistance. There's an online application process. And for the Air Force Aid Society, what the airmen will do, will uh, they will submit their online application to the nearest airmen and family readiness center to them. And then they will schedule an appointment to sit down to go over it. Because if you can't fix a problem unless you know what the problem is. And right. sometimes some folks need to, a little bit of help to articulate what's the real problem. Sometimes it's, I need money. Yes, but what are we trying to fix here? How are we going to stabilize you? What is the real problem? Let's address that. Because if you can't articulate the problem, you can't articulate the solution set. So you submit the application. You sit down with the caseworker. The caseworker will then render the assistance. If the, if you've got all the information right there, you can write out that check, and the airman and service member can be on their way. So that's how the assistance gets rendered. It's fairly quick. 
if you're going through the American Red Cross Services, the armed forces, they have the ability to do a blanket assist um, if it falls within certain parameters like emergency travel, uh, privation to avoid privation. But if it's over a certain dollar threshold, then they're going to contact the after hours caseworker to go over it to make sure that the assistance being rendered is in accordance with policies because Army mm -hmm. has a little different policy slightly than from us. It's, we're not too far off, but we want they want to make sure that they're rendering it in accordance with the policies, in accordance with the way we would have re um, rendered the assistance. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so we have essentially, we, all, we do, so we have a quick assist and we have direct um, access and the quick assist is a, um, a first sergeant or a commander can actually approve up to $2,500 because I think that just changed um, of, um, of a loan amount right there. So essentially they fill out the paperwork, they do all the vetting, and then that soldier will, will go into the Army Emergency Relief Office and provide that that paperwork to the AER and they'll cut a check. And now, you know, due to COVID, we have about, um, so we have about 72 offices Army-wide, 26 of them right now are operational in person, practicing social distancing. Um, and and, you know, so if you can go into an office, otherwise you go online, you download that application, you provide it to the office that is closest to you. And, um, and e we can actually process it via EFT. And that will, um, as long as all of the documents and, and requirements are in, that can get to the family within um, 24, max 48 hours. And um, just like Linda said, if they're, if they're in the office, the check can be cut right there. Um, so it is, it is really, really fast um, and um, just a great resource. So, so with the sat move order and the COVID, you know, guidance changing regularly, like, again, people with these changes, I mean, we're already used to flying by the seat of our pants sometimes because, you know, the hurry up and wait and then things change and change and then it doesn't change and then everything changes at once. Everything with this, the, the stop move order is, is changing in phases. Um, and with all of this changing regularly, um, you mentioned that, you know, there are some COVID related uh, initiatives to assist families. Krista, what has AER implemented exactly? So like, say I'm impacted somehow, you know, what, what do, what, what is new than, than what was happening before? Um, one of the things I take into account is that the relief societies really do complement the branches themselves. Um, we are, right, we're, we are the Army's nonprofit, the Air Force's nonprofit. And so um, I think we can, um, most things don't turn on a dime, I guess, but we've done a really good job of that. And um, in response to the need, especially with COVID. And so we've done things, um, we've expanded ex assistance to non-Title 10 um, Army National Guard and Army Reserve um, who may be affected by the stop movement. And for example, you know, in, they're incurring a loss of pay um, due to the inability to drill. Um, and AER can assist with insurance premiums and living expenses and such. And also uh, any reserve component that has been activated in response to COVID-19 is also eligible for basic living expenses and personal travel, like we said, tires, rental car, you know, and such. And then also um, we've added new categories of assistance. So, you know, I mean, we're homeschooling just like, every, you know, I mean, everybody is homeschooling and it looks differently, I think, across the board. But mm -hmm. we've included homeschooling supplies and equipment. Um, so effective um, immediately, or I guess a, a few days ago, um, soldiers with dependent children, kindergarten through 12th grade, can receive up to $500 per family for supplies um, to support those homeschooling efforts. And the eligibility period, for the category um, is retroactive, which is not the norm. So um, it actually goes back to March 1st. Okay, so so if, so if okay, just make sure yeah. I'm getting this right. So if I was affected and I'm dealing with the homeschooling kids and those extra expenses mm -hmm. and it, it was, so and then, so now this new, new initiative's in place and even though I already spent them, I could come mm -hmm. and say, okay, uh, can't help and and that yeah. could help offset that now yeah. is that like is that loan is that grant like 
So it could be one, you know, it could be a grant, it could be a loan, it could be a combination of both. It all depends on, I think what I love about, um, about the process is when you fill out your budget to identify um, if it can be a loan, a grant, or a combination of both. Um, I mean, think about that. I, you know, you're writing down all your monthly expenses. And I mean, if I go into my iPhone and I go under subscriptions, I'm going to find things that I did not realize I subscribed oh, to boy. and that I'm Preach. paying for monthly. Preach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So you, you find those things out, but yes, you can, you, um, and most things you apply for the assistance because you can't afford to put the money up front. Right. Well, this is, you know, knowing that obviously we're at the end of the school year, we're doing the retro where you can apply for that assistance retroactive to March 1st. But, um, you know, also going forward, a lot of schools are, uh, are offering homeschool, um, options. I'm sorry, summer homeschool options so that you, um, you can move forward with that as well. And so it's going to cover pencils, books, paper. Um, I think that it actually states, uh, pencil sharpeners and, but also subscriptions and, you know, possibly computers or tablets and printers, because we see that a lot of, a lot of kids maybe don't have a tablet and can't actually do the work from home. Um, and if you have to extend your, your Wi-Fi, I mean, I know we had to increase that when, I mean, I always work from home, but when everybody's here, <laughs> the Wi-Fi doesn't work as well as it did before. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm excited about that because I think that it's really gonna, it's really going to make a positive impact on our on our families. Um, and the other thing that we've added is, you know, unfortunately the um, the heartbreaking part of, I mean, life life still happens, and fortunately, family members are still passing away, and you know, you're not able to travel, and so we've added dignified storage of remains, and so you know, the state restrictions or the DOD travel um, and stop movement ban may prohibit you from burying a loved one. And um, we know that extending those traditional processes can be very costly. Um, and we wanna make sure that our soldiers and families don't have to make a decision to move forward with a funeral um, due to the inability to attend, um, you know, based on not being able to afford um, any of that. And so, um, you know, we've been listening and certainly um, have have really tacked on to a lot of the army policies and such. So, um, you know, we want to be able to accommodate in that way as well. Yeah, that is so, so awesome, Chris. I love hearing. It's always heartwarming as, as a spouse, as a family to hear when we have issues to see these organizations come together to look at the policies, to change, you know, what needs to be changed and to add things to kind of help families so they're not out there struggling. So Linda, with the Air Force uh, Aid Society, what type of COVID related assistance have families been seeking um, from the Air Force side? And is, is the AFAS doing anything differently because of COVID happening? We, Air Force Aid Society looks at things just a little bit differently. Um, you can create programs and put the flavor or the pandemic or the natural disaster associated name associated with it and call it that. Financial emergency is financial emergency, regardless mm -hmm. of the cause, whether it's COVID, whether it's a Hurricane Michael, like of 20, late 2018, what's the emergency? Now, having said that, we're not above stealing you know, good ideas. And so <laughs> just like AER stole that idea from the Coast Guard Mutual Assistance or, uh, Program, they, they had the school program. And, and so all the other relief societies, the chief operating officers, we meet quarterly and we're constantly on the phone with each other. What are you doing? What are you doing? Okay, hey, that sounds good. Can I steal that? What's the deets? And so we go into all of that. So we do the same kinds of thing. We're a little slower on the uptake on the school um, piece because I've communicated with the Air Force to ask them, are you seeing this need? Because as Coast Guard is offering this. We've got AER now stepping up offering this. We're not seeing that ask. And so our, our you know, we've got lots of donors that want to donate to a COVID case, but we're just right now not seeing a whole lot because frankly, people are still locked up. And so, and they're not spending the money because they're locked up. And so we, we're not seeing the pull for COVID um, uh, uh, for COVID assistance. But that's not to say that the need isn't there. We just haven't been told that. And so we're thinking 
um, and probably going to get in line with that. So um, that's kind of like a peek under the tent, but we're not there yet. And if we do, we will make sure that all our other fellow release societies are aware of it so they can share the word and our installation folks are aware of it so that they can get the word out and be ready. Um, when you implement a new program, we we need to make sure our airmen and family readiness centers can are prepared for the stampede that happens when you say, hey, <laughs> come on out. So we know that's going to happen. So we just we have to make a very systematic, thoughtful and logical approach to that. With that said, we have received requests for assistance. And if it's even got any slight trace of a COVID tail to it. We put a purpose code up against it that's internal to our team here so that we can see that it's got a COVID trail to it mm -hmm. so that we can track it. Our assistants going out the door, um, typically about 80% plus is interest-free loans. Um, and the balance is uh, is outright grants. And in response to the COVID cases or those COVID coded co cases, those are going at an interest free loans with an eye towards converting to a grant so that the service member doesn't have to be reminded of that when they set up the repayment at some future date. The assistance, uh, we've had a couple of stop movement types of requests. Uh, without getting into too much PII, you've got a service member at one installation. PCS, household goods are packed. They're about ready to make that journey cross country and all of a sudden stop movement. And yeah. the stuff's already on the way. They're probably giving up their residence there. Now they've got to get into a residence. So we've helped them to get into that residence. Um, we've had some spouses, uh, mostly in the retiree category, whose uh, service retirees whose spouses have lost their jobs and maybe didn't qualify for unemployment. So they're feeling a little strapped. So we've helped them out. But the cases I think that are, are hardest are those whose uh, immediate family member passed away. And so you know that they're, they have to travel. They want to travel. And, and the commanders are indulging them, allowing them to travel. We haven't had any um, holding of remains um, for a funeral at a later date requests, but we've had quite a few requests for folks to, to travel due to a funeral, due to the death of, a, of an immediate family member directly related to COVID. So not too many cases, but powerful cases nonetheless. Yeah. Yes, that is, it is. It's, and, and again, with, you know, I, independent of, of COVID, you know, when, when my dad passed away, of course my husband was gone and, um, and, you know, I had no choice but to just rely on my, on my military family members and scrape and, you know, up the dimes to grab that last minute flight, which is always, you know, buku bucks. And, you know, I can't even imagine, for a second, trying to do all of that through COVID because of the restrictions involved. And that is, I'm very, I'm very grateful. I want, you know what I mean? Like, I know that both organizations and, and if not all of the aid societies help with those situations in general, because literally it's one of the most painful moments of a person's life and having to do go down the research rabbit hole. I mean, if, if I could go to one of the eight societies and be like, this is happening. Oh my God, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And and knowing that somebody could guide me through that, that's a, that's a huge comfort to know um, and a huge resource. I think one of the reasons why we decided to actually include that as a, as a category of assistance is because, you know, w we are seeing that, yes, you know, the command of course is going to allow that service member, you know, to travel, but is it going to be the um, the ceremony that you want for your loved one? Because we do know. So, I mean, as you as um, you know, Megan and MJ, you both know that I'm a, a gold star spouse as well. And so, you know, I, I I've, I've worked with families in terms of you know they've wanted to postpone the funeral because. Um, you know, only 10 people can come and they have to wear masks and they have to social distance. And so, and then also other family members maybe, you know, cannot travel due to health restrictions and so on. And so we just wanted to be able to, um, to, to really specify that, to let them know that, you know, that this is important to us and we know that this is important to you and, and we've got your back. So. 
But uh, again, just like Linda said, you know, any, any emergency, anything, you know, obviously uh, comes in. Our, our motto is just ask. If you don't see it, just ask. And Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. You know, Megan and I were just talking about that, that, you know, if you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. Period. Under discussion, it's always going to be no. Make the ask because literally you might be closing a door on your own self, you know, and we don't want to do that. Um, so here's another question. Um, since we're on the, since we're kind of, you know, like on the, on the subject of, you know, Murphy and, and things happening all at the same time. And it's just crazy, you know, independent let's, let's, let's say that COVID, you know, just wasn't happening. Um, there's a lot of families PCSing right now, maybe not as many as peak season, but there's, you know, still a lot and it's going to be phased into bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So with those families, with those unique situations, um, you know, like what, what kind of PCS related expenses can families receive assistance with? Like specifically, um, we'll start, Krista, you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we kind of look at it as, you know, the, the, the PCS is broken out into, you know, a few different, um, you know, getting ready for the move, traveling during your move, and then, um, you know, what you may need when you get there. And so I know Linda touched on, on a lot of those um, items that, um, that are available. So as you're getting ready for your move, the deposits, vehicle maintenance, making sure the vehicle is safe to travel, um, you know, maybe paying off those utility bills. <clears throat> Um, and then, you know, during your move, if there's any expenses and um, that you're incurring on your way from one duty station to the next. And then when you arrive, you know, those basic living expenses, first and last month's rent or that mortgage and um, few food, utilities, appliance repair, um, replacement or purchase, maybe you show up and wait, there's no refrigerator here. Um, and I didn't realize it <laughs> type thing. But then the other piece of it is, is um, which is a new category this year is the um, spouse relicensing and um, or actually last year, I apologize, the spouse relicensing and recertification. And so say you're a mental health professional, and you're going from one state to the next, you're going to have to spend money in in getting yourself relicensed and recertified in that new state. And so we assist and that complements the Army's program as well with that. And then, um, you know, I mean, going back to the vehicle maintenance, you know, if you're driving 3000 miles, you're going to want to get an oil change, you might want to check your tires and, you know, and all of that. And so um, I would say, again, right, if you can dream it, ask, <laughs> because it definitely, um, it definitely can fall in line with with a, a lot of our categories because we have over thirty different categories of assistance. But that's those specific things are not the only things we cover. As Linda said, emergency is emergency, and whatever falls under that, you know, in your particular situation and your family, um, you know, we can help with. Boom! Drop the mic. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> oh, oh, see. <laughs> Why you? Because I felt that so way much. for you the whole time. <laughs> oh my! I just can I just say this is just fantastical. I just like I just I just this is I like it. <laughs> um, mic drop. Oh my god! I love that. I can't even follow that. All right. <laughs> Megan, what you got, girl? Exactly that. Um, so a lot of families, a lot of service members uh, that they're always worried about needing to get their command involved when seeking financial assistance. What would you tell these families, these service members that are worried about having their command involved in their financial situations? What what advice, words of wisdom, encouragement can you provide for them? She's over there. Pick me. Go ahead. Me. I just got through having a, a Zoom meeting with the first sergeants about two hours ago. So mm -hmm. I said this to the first sergeants and I'm I'm an open book. So I'm just going to say what I said to them. I always tell them, don't be a speed bump. You know, when an airman has an emergency need and they need and they go to the airman and family men in the center, don't grab them by the collar and jerk them back and say, how dare you go past me? First of all, if an airman understands that they've got a problem and they know the solution set resides in their Airmen and Family Readiness Center in the way of an Air Force Aid Society assist, and they recognize that's the lifeline, that's a resilient airman. So mm -hmm. we don't ask commanders to get involved. We don't ask for sergeants to get involved. Some commanders do want to be involved. And, and, and if 
our caseworkers are savvy enough that when they render assistance or to an airman and they're looking at the emergency and they're looking at what's presented, they can kind of see that, ooh, this problem is deeper. This is the tip of the iceberg. There's more under here, more than what we can do. Maybe we need to get the collective Air Force family, not just Air Force Aid Society, in around this airman to lift them up and lift their problem and solve this solution to solve this problem. That's when that commander and first sergeant is going to be involved. If our spidey senses go off tingling, we're going to call the first sergeant. We're going to get the commander and after we tell the airman, um, hey, we're going to get your commander and first sergeant involved because this is bigger than just Air Force aid at this point in time. Here's how we're going to help you, the big collective family. That's the key. Um, if there are times that a commander or first sergeant will bring the airman in because they recognize we're the only lifeline they've got and we'll work with them. As, if commanders and first sergeants really think that we're going to be able to help them, we're going to do everything to respect that and try to do that. But we don't want them to, mother may I, before I go to Air Force Aid Society. Um, they're adults. <laughs> if they're going to fight for our country, they should have every right to go in and ask for help and get that help. And if we can't be the total fix-all uh, salvation, then let's go back to the commander first sergeant and say, are there other resources other than our small part that we can help with that you can offer the service member? Wow, I'd say that's a mic drop. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I also, you know, I also think that, um, you know, that our, our soldiers should, should give the commanders the benefit of the doubt because you know, as as AER, right, we're providing that financial assistance, but um, but I think they're going to need a lot more than that, right? I mean, there's a reason why we have care teams and family readiness groups and all of that, and we want we really, I think, um, want to give them now if they choose the direct access, then that's what they choose. Um, uh, but you know. I would encourage people to, you know, to trust their command and also asking for help. And I know that this is a big thing and we've talked about it for a long time, but asking for help is a, is a sign of strength, not weakness, Absolutely. right? We know that your family is your number one priority and whatever risk or consequences you believe may come from that by going and talking to your command about it, um, you know, I would say would be worth it if there is a consequence or they surprise you and they wrap their arms around you and they say, okay, AER is going to provide this, but we're going to help you with all of these other things mm -hmm. as well. So um, I think looping the command in as a, as kind of a family unit is, is always important as well. And, you know, um, I just, I mean, like, I've never utilized uh, in my case, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. And, and to be honest, I think it was because, I didn't really understand it. I thought I I was always under the assumption when I was young, you only go when it's about to hit the fan and you can't pay for food or water or you're getting evicted or something crazy. And you definitely don't want to do that if you don't want to ruin your husband's career. All this, I, I, I grew, I kind of grew into it afraid of it. And of course, you know, I mean, over time, all of the aid societies recognize that. And I'm glad to hear you acknowledge that because you know, even today, there are there are spouses and there are families and there are service members that are thinking, uh, no way, man, I don't want to be put on the blotter. Um, We've had people say, I was told that I'd lose my security clearance if I go to AER and receive a loan or a grant. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and it's just it's misinformation. True. Like, you really got to yeah. go to the source. That's why, I like, you know, having you guys on here is you go yeah. to the source. You're not just talking to Lance Corporal Schmuckatelli in the smoke pit, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, that's just the, that's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, are, uh, fortunately we learned over time, double check those sources. <laughs> and I would also say that, you know, that, that they should think outside the box too, that, you know, that the aid societies are such, such a great resource and, and uh, I, I would say a pillar right in in the whole process um i have a i spoke to a woman and she said you know my husband retired um you know five years ago something happened you know my daughter and son-in-law um were getting ready to have a baby my son-in-law 
um, fell out of a tree as an arborist, fell out of a tree and didn't have insurance. And so their funds were going to help their daughter and son-in-law and they were able to come to Army Emergency Relief to actually pay their household bills. And so, I mean, that's not always the case, but I would say um, whatever the reason being that that you're not able to do those, you know, pay for those basic living expenses, um, come in and talk, you know, just ask. <laughs> just again, see, sensing a theme here, make the ask. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so let me ask you something. How, how do the, do your respective organizations generally, um, you know, raise funds to provide these services? Like how, how, how do you raise these funds and, 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 you know, is COVID impacting that at all? Like, I think you might've touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, so Colonel, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. So all the military relief societies have um, a, a, fund, a funding campaign and we, typically it's about the same part part of the year it starts at about uh, late February and runs through about early March mm -hmm. and so our campaign was in full swing and then COVID hit and as you can imagine everybody just kind of hunkered down um, so we are not part of the combined federal campaign uh, we have a lot of military members, a lot of civilian folks that seem to think that we are. The military relief societies run their own campaign independent of the combined federal campaign, which is centered around the local communities campaigns and these national um, uh, organization, charitable organizations. And I, I've donated to CFC, but I've also donated to the Military Relief Society campaigns. Well, COVID's taken a big hit. Our campaign was underway. Everybody went hunkered down. Um, it's dismal. It's dismal. Um, but uh, we're planning to have a, uh, we're, we're, our campaign is going to pick back up again about mid-July, and they're going to do a two-week lightning round, or they call it, or a Thunderbird round. They keep changing the names. But then anyway, <laughs> they're going to do a, a, a quick reattack for two weeks, hoping that folks will consider making donations. Um, I, I can speak, I think, on behalf of all the relief societies, the military uh, population donations to our campaigns over the years have trended downward. Um, but then it's, it, and, and that's the lifeblood. This is the, we exist. It's all about airmen helping airmen and, um, and it's soldiers helping soldiers. So we look for the active duty and the retiree population to donate to our campaigns so that they can continue to help the current population as well as the generations that have served and the generations looking forward that will continue, that will serve. So, but it's, it's been difficult this year. So please donate if you have the extra funds. So uh, uh, Krista, before yeah. you, you probably piggyback off of, uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead and I want to tell our audience right now that I personally MJ boy separate of PCS grades. I plan on donating, um, at least once to each aid society. I'm going to make that awesome. commitment to you now, and mm -hmm. I'm going to put that out to you from a military spouse to the rest of my military families. You know what I mean? These are the services. They're here for us. And if they're not here for us, they're here for our, the people that we're already taking care of. So I'm committing to, to giving a, a donation to each and every one, regardless of my affiliation with that service or not. So I challenge you to do the same. Thank um, you. And Krista, so tell, tell me, is it, is it, do you, do you, Yes. Go. Yes. It's definitely, you know, we have, and you know, I mean, exactly like Linda said, we've said the active duty, we've seen that kind of trending down. There are so many organizations out there um, that are maybe unit specific that are fantastic, but I would, I would encourage um, families to, to look at the categories and look at the services that the relief societies provide and definitely donate to those other organizations, but consider um, supporting their their branch relief society as well, because, you know, the 0% loans, I mean, I can't get that from my parents, right? We, like, <laughs> it just no, doesn't even if, even if you don't have to pay interest, you're going to get it taken out somewhere. No, I oh, pay yeah. interest, I can assure you, in more ways than one. <laughs> no, <laughs> my parents are amazing. But I would say, you know, and, and we do complement so many of the, of, so for example, TRICARE, um, you know, may cover cranial helmets for certain things, but a lot of times they don't. And so, I mean, when you look at 
what that expense is over time as the cranial, as the, um, the helmet, you know, you have to get new ones as, um, as the skull develops. And so, I mean, that could be $5,000. Well, with Army Emergency Relief, that's, that's a grant and it's probably very similar with Air Force Aid Society. And so we know what is provided by TRICARE and by the actual branch. And we want to expand upon that, you know, just like the relicensing and recertification, the Army will pay up to a thousand dollars, but we'll give you a loan for that first thousand dollars because we know you're going to get that back from them. But then we go up to twenty five hundred. That could be a loan or a grant or a combination of both. And so, um, you know, there's that kind of wiggle room, I would say. Uh, the campaigns run um, for Army Emergency Relief from the 1st of March through the 15th of every year. And it's actually in accordance with Army Regulation um, 930-4, if you want to look it up, <laughs> that units um, that units can run. So I know that a lot of uh, service members are afraid to, you know, talk about or fundraise or, or anything. But it actually is in the regulation that you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to talk about CFC. You're allowed to talk about your relief societies. Um, and just make sure that everybody is aware of those resources and, you know, and hopefully that does elicit some, you know, some do donations. I would say a third of our um, donations every year come from the active duty component and a third comes from the retiree and a third we call outside the gate. Right. Um, and so, um, and we are also the, you know, Sergeant Major of the Army, the Chief of Staff and the Secretary decided that we're going to open up uh, another campaign in July um, due to obviously COVID that kind of caught us <laughs> right at the beginning and has has filtered all the way through. So, um, yeah, so that's exciting that we get another opportunity to get, get out there because the campaigns are a lot of in-person gatherings and um, mm. and they just haven't been able to do that. Right. I, I definitely think that, I mean, everybody's going to have to get more creative now with social distancing yeah. guidelines having to be put in place. Man, I can't even tell you. Um, I mean, this right here is fantastic, though. I mean, we're informing so many people. Yes. And, <laughs> and let me tell you. Um, Linda, like, I think we're doing our job right here. We, oh, yeah. And, you know, after the 24-hour period, I can't tell you how many Oconus families watch this. Yeah. Um, we see a huge uptick because, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? People want to know what they're walking into. And yes, there are some variances, but for the fact of the matter is, especially in this case, OCONUS, CONUS, mm -hmm. Relief Society's got your back, period. End of discussion. Boom. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so, um, yeah, before we get, I want to get some advice from you both. But before we do that, we had just a couple questions. Um, and one of them, I think this one will go to, um, to Krista. What documents would be needed to show proof that the person actually needs funds for the items that were purchased for homeschooling? in order to get AER assistance? Mm, well, that would be for our sergeant majors, but I would say you, if you're doing the retro, you would provide the receipt for the, um, for what you purchased for the equipment and supplies. And, um, and I'm pretty sure you generally will fill out a, a budget. So everything through the, um, through our Relief Society is, is definitely a need base. But um, if you go onto the Army Emergency Relief site, you can do a office locator and see who the, you know, who's closest to you. Um, and it will actually pop up the other relief societies um, if, if, you know, an Air Force Aid Society or Coast Guard Mutual Assistance is the closest. Um, and then I would just encourage to call um, and, and double check that because the regulations just went out. Okay. Um, and, and just for the record for our audience, um, we're going to get any links that, that we reference, any resources that we reference, you know, we, we drop the links either in real time or, you know, shortly after the webinar is over, everything they talk about, we're going to make sure that you have access to. Um, and of course we always wrap this up. You know, we've got our buddy Lizanne Lightfoot, um, who's our content manager. She's transcribing all of this as we speak and she'll give you that meat and potatoes, all the bullet points and takeaways, plus the video and links as well on our blog. Um, and so our, I think the next question that I have is, um, this one might be for Megan actually. Um, Anna, hi Anna. Um, she's wondering if they've released the, the list of um, installations that are allowed to PCS uh, or it, to see if they need, you know, an ETP in exception to policy um, to PCS after June 30th. 
Yes, so they haven't released that list yet. Everybody is patiently, unpatiently waiting for that list to know where they can move move and not move to. Um, So until they release the list, the guidance is to assume every location is red and that you should be seeking an exception to policy for your PCS. Um, Once they release that, what they're calling the green list or the go list, once they release that, your gaining and your losing installation need to be on that list um, to be able to PCS without the exception to policy. So my guidance to everybody has been, if if you really, really want to move, you should be seeking that exception to policy. (laughs) Absolutely. And again, for questions like this, you know what I mean? Like, we could tell you, you know, this is green, this is red and and whatnot. But if you need that exception to policy or even if you just want to ask the question, again, part of the theme, ask the question, your chain of command, boom, go to them, ask them these questions. They know you, they know your situation, they can help you out. And then from there, of course, your transportation office to yeah. go to, of course. Um, let's see. Um Okay, so my my the advice that I'm looking for. So I would love to know tips, resources, advice. So especially as it's related, whether it's related to PCSing, whether it's related to seeking assistance under normal circumstances outside of COVID, what what tips do you have right now for our audience, for our families watching? Um, Krista, do you want to go? I know you mentioned something. Uh, something about let's take this time. Well, you know, yeah, definitely take this time. um, If you have extra time, (laughs) I mean, a lot of us do, but then, you know, obviously with, with the kids home and, you know, um, for me, my husband's (laughs) home now too. Um, Everybody's in my office, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) I work from home. Now everybody's invading my office. Um, But no, take the time to just kind of, you know, sift through, start with the Relief Societies, go from there. Blue Star Families has done a great job. They have um, a link on their site with a lot of resources. Um, The Aid Societies are on there. They have done webinars that you can go back and listen to if there's something, Mm -hmm. you know, but never assume that a topic doesn't pertain to you because it may in the future. And if you just educate yourself, not only for yourself to say, oh, wait, I learned about that, you know, five years ago, or when you're talking to one of your friends, hey, I know where you can get, you know, assistance for for your car. We had a um, we had a spouse say, oh my goodness, I, we were out in the field, if you will, at the installation, and and had a, a spouse luncheon, and she said, my husband had deployed. I had four kids. I'm driving down the freeway, and all of a sudden, like my car broke down and the engine seized. And she said, an army emergency relief like saved my life, she said, because it was a, you know, she was able to go to AER, you know, an Air Force Aid Society, I'm sure is the same and all the other relief societies, even if your service member is downrange or, you know, TDY somewhere, we can connect with them because it does, you know, if it's a loan for some reason, it does come out of their, of their pay. So you never have to worry about every month writing a check and, you know, going through all of that. And so um, really just familiarize with your, yourself with all of the resources. USO has been putting on some great events as well. Um, and just kind of sit in and peruse. I mean, even if it's going through social media and you're finding finding this this event, um, you know, I think it's all of it Shout is relevant, out. not only for... Um, for you, but for your military family as well. So Mm -hmm. there's almost information overload because there's so many organizations out there that are willing to help service members, um, Mm -hmm. whether it's COVID or, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever the flavor, whatever the pandemic, whatever the emergency is, they're willing to help. Mm -hmm. But the relief societies are there for our service members. And and so uh, start there first start there first. And one of the challenges I think that we as a relief society are having to do is we recognize this, the social distancing thing, all our programs are delivered face to face, you know, in our centers, you know, no social distancing. We, we get right up next to you and try to help you. And so now it's hug like, on you, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spit on you, smooth on you. Yeah. Now, now we've got to rethink this. And so I, I've, I've got to give it, um, 
uh, I, I got to give kudos to, to the team here that I work with, as well as the team that's out in the mm -hmm. field executing our programs on our behalf, um, because it's our Air Force members, it's our Air Force team members out there that are delivering our capability. We have the funds, but the Air Force folks in the Airmen and Family Readiness Center are delivering our capabilities. And suddenly with the social distancing is that bundles for babies class. It used to have 30 parents in there and, you know, on all, you know, laughing and chatting and scratching and all that. No, that's not happening. And so we've had some folks say, can we do that socially? Just Can we do it like this? What's the value of it? Is there a benefit? Is it good? Is it bad? How do we do that? And so we're finding people asking these questions and God bless them for coming up with the ideas because we're not smart enough to think of them all that when you get enough people together, you get some good ideas going, you get some traction. And so we've got bases that are out there saying, well, we're gonna try that out here and see how it works. We wanna make sure that we're controlling the, the $50 gift card. We wanna control that. But we also want to make sure that it's value added. It's not one of those mute the mic, mute the camera and go off and do something else and then come back in at the very end and say, yeah, I was here for the entire hour. Yeah, count me in. No, yeah. we want this kind of interaction to know that what we delivered to you was benefiting you under that program name. And OK, and we'll still deliver it, that award reward at the end. So we're looking for ideas like that. We're, tr we're trying to navigate through this because I don't know how long this is going to go on. And mm -hmm. frankly, I don't know if it's going to resurge again. I don't know mm -hmm. while we're flattening the curve. We have no idea with everything that's going on today that it might not spike again. And so then what happens? Well, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to that for a second because you've seen a lot of schools, for instance, a lot of the schools who have never implemented virtual learning or remote learning. Um, they struggled, but those who actually incorporated it and supplemented their curriculum with it already had a great baseline. So in, a, in military life, we have to have a contingency plan for our contingency plans. <laughs> and so by taking that mindset, go into it as if it's going to happen for the next year. That way you're already set up if it does. Mm -hmm. And we would be happy to help you guys in any way. And the best, I'm going to tell you right now, you want to talk about idea fairies? Okay, because Kristen and I have gone down the the, the the rabbit hole of, of idea fairies. Yes, you know. we have. <laughs> but I'm gonna the buy best myself some wings, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the best resource. I'm not even kidding you. Military spouses. They're gonna. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get ideas from their ideas, and then modify them into more ideas, and then you're gonna explode, and it's gonna be awesome. And that's a, that's a resource you definitely want to tap into. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Well, yeah. I want to thank you both for, for being on today. Um, it's been a blast. It's been like, I'm not even kidding you in this entire webinar. If you want to go back and watch the replay, we have laughed, we have teared up. If you didn't, uh, we need to get you to replay it again. Um, <laughs> we have learned and we have understood that we've got people who have our back and oh, by the way, they're exactly like us. They are us. And that's really important. And so um, any questions that you have, again, leave them in the comments. We're going to stay in touch with these wonderful ladies. And um, any follow-up questions you have, we'll, we'll get to them. Any resources they mentioned will be dropped into the links. And until next week, this too shall be yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.